All rise. Please be seated. The Special Court for Sierra Leone is sitting in an open session in the case of the prosecutor versus Charles Ganke Taylor. Justice Richard Lassick presiding. Good morning. We'll, we'll take appearances first, please. Good morning, Mr. President, uh, Your Honors, uh, Honored Consul. Uh, appearing today for the prosecution, uh, Stephen Rapp, prosecutor, together with principal trial attorney Brenda Hollis, Mohammed Bangura, Catherine Haworth, Christopher Santora, Maya <coughs> Dimitrova, and James Johnson. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you, Mr. Rapp. Y yes, uh, Mr. Gouris. Good morning, Mr. President, Your Honor's counsel opposite. For the defense today, myself, Courtney Griffiths, Assisted by my learned friends, Mr. Morris Anya, Mr. Terry Monyard, and Councillor Superwood, and also our case manager, Salomonen. And also we're joined today by the acting principal defender, uh, Mrs. Uh, Claire Carlton Anseals. Thank you, uh, Mr. Gillis. Well, I, I think uh, both parties realize uh, there's an order permitting photography. I don't know what happened, but obviously uh, it has not been followed. The uh, order was in the terms that the photographer shall be in a position 10 minutes before the start of the proceedings. And I see he uh, is not in court at all. Um, he's entitled, uh, once the court sits, to take uh, photographs for a period of one minute. I'll, call, I'll bring the photographer in uh, on this occasion, but uh, if these uh, orders are not followed strictly in, in the future, then uh, we'll simply overlook the, uh, the order. Madam Court Manager. Thank you, Madam Court Manager. Well, uh, today uh, is scheduled for the opening of the defence case, and uh, <coughs> as became evident uh, last week, at the status conference. The defense will make a, an opening statement today. The court will then adjourn and the defense will go into evidence tomorrow morning. Uh, having said that, I'll call on you, Mr. Griffiths. May it please, Your Honor. 
We've broken down our address into the following chapters. <coughs> First of all, we're going to introduce the topic. We will then provide a brief chronology of how and why we come to be here. And we do that for this reason. In opening their case, we were told by Stephen Rapp, the chief prosecutor, in a speech laced with references to the geopolitics of the region, that, and I quote, the prosecutor will seek at all times to ensure that it embodies the fundamental principles of fairness, due process, and justice that along with the other trials at the special court will help ensure a future respect for the law and the maintenance of a just and peaceful and safe society. And in concluding his address to your honors, what, almost two years ago, in fact, over two years ago, he said this, there are those in this world who are ready to uphold the law and to decide that no matter how high the position of the person responsible, there will be a day of justice. Now we say quite simply and bluntly right up at the outset that that claim is simply just not true. When one examines the way in which the Office of the Prosecution have behaved, from the unveiling of the indictment in this case, and throughout the investigation and trial. We say that sentiment expressed by the prosecution at the outset is riddled with hypocrisy and untruth. And we must, if we are properly to protect Mr. Taylor's interests, address all aspects of the prosecution case, including that. Thirdly, we will then look at the reality of this supposed commitment to equality before the law by examining briefly the experience of the previous defense team. And why do we do this? Simply because Mr. Taylor may be asked in cross-examination, and we need, of course, to anticipate this, why did you dispense with your previous defense team? We will then briefly examine when we, this team, came on board and what was our task. And in light of that analysis, we will then look at what this case is really about. What is the issue? Have the prosecution truly sought to address that issue? We are here to assist you judges. And it is important that you know what the issues are as we see them, because we appreciate that we are confined in opening our case by Rule 84, a provision of which the learned president of this court rightly reminded me last Monday. We therefore fully understand that we need to proceed with care. Now, having dealt with that, thereafter, we will necessarily have to examine the accused's decision to give evidence. Because, again, he might be asked about that. And in looking at that, we feel that it is equally important that we critically examine the lens through which we should examine his account. So we will examine, first of all, prejudice. We will also go on to examine emotion and the fact that neither can play a role in our task. How should the defense case be examined, we say, is a very important question. We're then going to go on and look at the prosecution case and question its adequacy. We do that because we need to define where we say it is lacking in proof, and consequently where we can assist you judges in your task 
by providing further proof. Because we want to focus our case on just those aspects of the case. Now having done that, we will then examine the defense case. Undoubtedly there will be no problem with that. Because at the heart of Rule 84 is what our duty is in that regard. And thereafter, finally, we will conclude. So let us commence. At the outset, we make it clear that we're not here to cause offense for the sake of it. We are here to defend a man who we say is innocent of these charges. However, whilst we appreciate that the primary function of this opening address is to outline the case for the defense in this court of law, it must equally be recognized that this case has been played out over at least six years by the prosecution in the court of public opinion worldwide. And so we are conscious that our audience is far wider than your honors, the judges in this courtroom. And inevitably, we must address that wider audience so long as, of course, we adhere to the rules. However, we bear in mind also that part of this court's ambition is to gain international respect for the rule of law, an ambition which it primarily achieves by allowing a wider world to observe and understand its habits, methods of analysis, and its findings in the cases it hears. And I've already reminded your honors of the lofty aspirations of the prosecution in this court. Our plea must therefore be couched in language and terms appropriate to all who have the opportunity to listen. Sadly, much of West Africa does not have that opportunity. And we are constrained to do so because we deal with reality and not theory. For we say that not many of those who readily want to pass judgment on Charles Taylor truly know the details of this case, which covers a period of history in West Africa, which for much of the time, the West and its media completely ignored. The United States of America had no time for its love child, unless, of course, it was perceived to endanger the warped Cold War logic which governed global foreign relations at the birth of this conflict. It has to be remembered that the events we are considering occurred at a time when walls were coming down. So let's move on then and deal with the chronology. Charles Taylor was indicted on the seal on the 7th of March, 2003. The indictment was announced on the 4th of June, 2003, on his first trip outside of Liberia after the indictment had been imagined into being, we say, by David Crane, the then chief prosecutor. Now in a revealing footnote to a prepared statement presented to a hearing before the United States House of Representatives Subcommittee on Africa on the 8th of February 2006, that same David Crane former chief prosecutor of this court said this, and I quote, the unsealing of the indictment against Charles Taylor on the day he arrived in Accra, Ghana for the peace talks in June of 2003 was a calculated move on my part. Pause there. Mr. Crane, of course, that chief prosecutor, 
was present at the opening of the prosecution case in this courtroom. He was afforded a name check by Stephen Rapp, the prosecutor, i.e. was bigged up in front of a worldwide audience. Yet when speaking of that piece he mentioned, it must re be remembered that the statute which established this court provided that, and I quote, this court should have the power to prosecute persons who bear, one, the greatest responsibility for serious violations of international humanitarian law and Sierra Leonean law committed in the territory of Sierra Leone since the 30th of November 1996, including those leaders, two, who in committing such crimes, hear this, have threatened the establishment of and implementation of the peace process in Sierra Leone. So this is a court set up to, for the preservation of peace. Bearing that in mind, here we have the chief prosecutor in such a court in t attempting to scupper peace in Accra, Ghana in June of 2003. Why should a prosecutor in this court seek to do that? And why did he do that? Charles Taylor will explain why. But in any event, Mr. Crane continued, was a calculated move on my part to publicly strip in front of the world this warlord of his power by my signature on the indictment. Pause again. Such ego and hubris. To quote Bob Marley, my countryman, working iniquity to achieve vanity. Now let's go back to what Mr. Crane was saying. It was never intended, that indictment, to force his transfer that day to the tribunal, though we would have accepted him and were ready to arraign him on the charges within the indictment immediately. Pause again. So there we have Mr. Crane claiming that way back, way back in June of 2003, this prosecution were ready to proceed. So we ask rhetorically, why hadn't they sorted out their indictment then? Why was their indictment thereafter edited on so many occasions, occasions of which we will remind this court? And yet look at the claim that he was making. And he continues, my intent was to humble and humiliate him before his peers, the leaders of Africa, and to serve notice to Taylor and others that the days of impunity in Africa were over. Pause again. Why not declare the end of impunity for all international wrongdoers? Why just Africa? And then he continues. Taylor is the first African head of state ever to be indicted for war crimes and crimes against humanity, and only the second in history. His indictment paved the way for the eventual election of Ellen Johnson Sirleaf as the first, note that, first fairly elected president of Liberia. So the Doe election of 1985, at a time when the US was pouring the greatest amount of aid it had ever had into a corrupt regime, a generosity it had never previously shown to its African slave child. And yet we are told that the election in 1997 as well, that too was obviously give Mr. Crane sentiment, not fear. And then he continues, it must be noted, and listen to this, it must be noted that the United States was given a copy of the Taylor indictment 
two months before it was unsealed in June 2003. It was personally given to Walter Kansteiner, then the Assistant Secretary of State for Africa, at a breakfast meeting in April of 2003 with the U.S. Ambassador Peter Chavez at his home in Freetown. Another copy was given to Pierre Prosper, the ambassador at large for war crimes issues as well. And pausing there, perhaps we ought to congratulate my learned friend Stephen Rapp on his nomination to soon fill that post. But he continues, does Mr. Crane, all parties were warned 24 hours in advance of the unsealing while Taylor was in Accra. The government of Ghana was served with the indictment and the warrant of arrest the morning of the unsealing of Taylor's indictment. Now one has to ask, why was the United States of America granted this particular favor two months in advance? And was this court notified, given that the indictment was on the seal, that the seal had indeed been broken? Was it? Now, what I've just quoted is a mere footnote, hidden away, yet loaded with meaning, particularly when you discover that the same David Crane goes on to say this, the trick to getting a West African leader's attention is cash, plain and simple, unlike, for example, a British member of parliament. And further, we say that money has played a crucial part in these proceedings, as we will deal with. Now, Charles Taylor was humiliated. That was, after all, calculated. And I can assure you that he, he is humbled although only by the trust placed in him by the people of Liberia, who rallied to his banner in 1989, including one Ellen Johnson Sirleaf. And those same Liberians elected him freely and fairly in 1997, an election congratulated by a former U.S. President, Jimmy Carter, yet ridiculed by a prosecutor of this court. However, I can assure you that he is certainly not humbled by this ill-conceived, revenge-seeking prosecution. Now, in August of 2003, he stepped down, resigned as president, and went into exile in Nigeria. How many times has that happened in Africa? Ian Smith in Rhodesia, now Zimbabwe, way, was certainly reluctant to do so in the face of mounting pressure until forced by the anti-imperialist struggle to step down, step down. Sadly, many others may have inherited his stubbornness in that country and unwillingness to go. And let me not start on South Africa and apartheid. Yet here was Taylor going without a whimper. And he is such a bad man. And that going was done by agreement, a deal brokered by Africans for Africans, backed by the United States, the United Kingdom, and the United Nations. Yet despite that agreement, he was handed over by the Nigerians to the Liberians and from thence to the Special Court for Sierra Leone on the 29th of March, 2006. It does sound calculated, doesn't it? And three months later, like an illegal immigrant, refugee or worse, and for those of an historical mind, in reverse, he was taken in chains from the shores of Africa and taken to Holland, thousands of miles away, 
the country of one of the colonizers of the black race for centuries. A historically familiar journey for some. So that was the challenge we faced as his defense. Now those originally instructed to defend Charles Taylor struggled valiantly, despite an appalling lack of resources to protect his interests. This was despite the gross disparity in the resources available to the defense, particularly when compared to the largesse available to the prosecution, which even included a fund, the source of which we have been unable to identify, and out of which lavish payments have been made to witnesses. Yet despite this, that defense team struggled on until the summer of 2007, when the injustice of the situation forced Charles Taylor to withdraw his cooperation with this court. Consequently, an attempted start of this trial on the 4th of June 2007 was swiftly aborted. And we were brought on board shaft shortly afterwards in an atmosphere of panic. This is how we come to be here. We sought and were granted four months to prepare and thereafter deal with a prosecution case involving voluminous documentation, a case which they had taken years to prepare. Yet after a few months' preparation, we dealt with this case efficiently and professionally. And why? Because it's the job of the experienced advocate to quickly locate the essence of a case and thereafter seek, for the sake of efficiency and brevity, to conclude it as swiftly as possible. That we have always sought to do so that this case proceeded from the 7th of January 2008 to the 27th of February 2009 without hardly a hitch or delay, unprecedented in my experience of almost 30 years for a trial of this complexity and logistical difficulty. This was 91 witnesses and 14 months later. And why was that? That was because we defined the issue here as being simple. We stated it at an early stage, and it remains our position. Consequently, it is not surprising that the prosecution themselves observed in opening this case, and I quote, The quote was to the effect that the essence of their indictment was how to link Mr. Taylor to these crimes. And consequently, we said this case should not have been about what in fact happened in Sierra Leone. There was no issue about that. It should solely have been about who bore the greatest responsibility. There being ample proof that he had made, that is Mr. Taylor, strenuous efforts to achieve peace in Sierra Leone, remembering, of course, the words of the statute. Proof which we will provide in abundant documentary form. Proof available to the prosecution, but which they ignored. We consequently do not and never have taken issue with the fact that terrible things, atrocities, were committed in Sierra Leone. We've never done that. We still cannot therefore understand why more than half of the witnesses called were so-called crime-based witnesses to prove a fact not in dispute. Let me assist with one or two statistics. 
91 prosecution witnesses were called. Of those, 52 were so-called crime-based witnesses. 33 were so-called linkage witnesses. But also appreciate this. The case having begun in January of 2008, by September of the same year, so nine months later, 27 of the 33 linkage witnesses had been called by September. So effectively, by September of last year, the prosecution had called the vast bulk of the evidence available to them on the central issue in dispute. And yet we spent from September right through until February of this year listening to some 42 crime-based witnesses giving evidence about the horror of their experience, a matter not in dispute. Yes, I, I'm Mr. reticent to rise, but uh, uh, the purpose of an opening statement is to talk about the evidence that the defense intends to present. They're talking about uh, evidence that the prosecution presented uh, numbers. I think the record reflects that all but two of these crime-based witnesses the defense objected to presenting in written form, and, uh, and we're hearing more argument at this stage that's probably fit for closing rather than for telling us what uh, kind of evidence we're going to receive uh, from the defense. Yes, uh, Mr. Kudos. Where I come from, Mr. President, it's regarded as rude to interrupt opposing counsel's opening speech or closing address. It's normal in my experience for such comments to be reserved until the address has been concluded. But in any event, we say, given the latitude afforded to Mr. Rapp when he was opening the prosecution case, we submit that we're perfectly entitled to make the points that we do particularly as we do so, we say, in order to set out the issues which we set out from the outset, which we feel we have to address. We cannot just go into a recitation of the defense evidence without any kind of context. Well, firstly, uh, uh, I can tell you, Mr. Grivas, that um, when the prosecution made its opening statement, the court uh, uh, took uh, care to uh, confine the prosecution as much as possible to the evidence it tended to present. And uh, as you've already made comment, you're well aware of the uh, requirements of Rule 84. But uh, we seem to, uh, we, uh, I beg your pardon, we're of the view that uh, what you're saying now um, is, is tied in with uh, evidence that you're going to present anyway. And uh, I th we think that uh, you're doing your best to lay out the defense case. Um, so we're going to overrule the objection, but we, we will direct your mind now to uh, what Rule 84 requires of you. Very well, Mr. President. <coughs> In any event, Your Honours, having defined the issue as we did, we resolve not to be distracted from the central question. That question being, how do you, the prosecution, say he is responsible? Yet we say, still, more than six years after the Office of the Prosecution first formulated the indictment, it remains uncertain where it should be precise. 
Thus, all of the following are suggested by the prosecution. Article 6.1 of the court statute explicitly lists five ways in which Charles Taylor could be held responsible for the atrocities that took place in Sierra Leone. That article holds individually criminally responsible or accountable persons who planned, instigated, ordered, committed, or aided and abetted in the planning, preparation, or execution of a crime within the court's jurisdiction. In addition, there is a sixth truth by which they claim he is liable. That sixth way in which Mr. Taylor could be held criminally responsible by this court is pursuant to Article 6.3 of its statute, but only to the extent that somebody, that he, Mr. Taylor, exercised authority over as a superior, someone who committed a crime within the court's jurisdiction and that he knew or had reason to know that his subordinate was about to commit such acts or had done so, and he, Taylor, failed to take necessary and reasonable measures to prevent such acts or to punish the perpetrators thereof. Now, the final route, the final way in which Charles Taylor could be held individually responsible is under a theory of joint criminal enterprise, or JCE, something which those of you who have been following this case know has attained infamous status because of how tortured its various formulations have been since the first indictment in March 2003. With this supposed route to conviction, there have been so many different formulations of it during the course of this case that it's frankly speaking difficult for one to keep track of what case Mr. Taylor is supposed to answer. Let us just trace that development. Stage one, in the first indictment that was signed by David Crane, it was alleged that Mr. Taylor participated in the joint criminal enterprise as, quote, part of his continuing efforts to gain access to the mineral wealth of Sierra Leone and to destabilize the government of Sierra Leone. Stage two, when Prosecutor Desmond De Silva filed the amended indictment on the 7th of March 2006, the phrase joint criminal enterprise was nowhere to be found in the indictment. Indeed, it had been deleted from the indictment in its entirety. Phase three, over a year later, on the 4th of April 2007, a couple of months before the trial was due to start, and after several years of preparation, when the prosecution filed its pretrial brief in this case, we began to see the emergence of diamonds as an expressly stated reason for Mr. Taylor's alleged participation in the common plan of the JCE. The pretrial brief alleged that Mr. Taylor, quote, participated in a common plan, design or purpose, to gain and maintain political power and physical control over the territory of Sierra Leone, in particular the diamond mining areas, in order to exploit the natural resources of the country. They went on to add, quote, Implementation of this common plan included overthrowing the government of Sierra Leone. Stage four. A few weeks later, during my learned friend Mr. Rapp's opening statement on the 4th of June 2007, he said that Mr. Taylor was, quote, responsible for the development and execution of a plan to take political and physical control of Sierra Leone in order to exploit its abundant natural resources and to establish a friendly or subordinate government there to facilitate that exploitation. However, stage five, when 
you judges in this chamber rendered your judgment on the 20th of June 2007 in the AFRC case and ruled that an alleged common purpose to take any actions necessary to gain and exercise political power and control over the territory of Sierra Leone, in particular the diamond mining areas, was not an international crime, nor a crime punishable under the statute. The prosecution panicked and filed on the 3rd of August 2007, version 5, an amended case summary, alleging there that the common plan that was shared by Mr. Taylor and other participants in the JCE was to inflict a campaign of terror on the citizens of Sierra Leone in order to pillage the resources of Sierra Leone, in particular the diamonds, and to forcibly control the pop population and territory of Sierra Leone. Yes, it had become terrorism. Now, I wonder where that term terrorism came from at a time when the so-called war on terror is still ongoing. A war which has dominated our lives for over a decade. So we say now, now that we've reached June, July 2009, which is it? Diamonds? Or is it political control? Or is it overthrowing the government of Sierra Leone? Or is it terrorizing the citizens of Sierra Leone? Which is it? Why are we, several years down the line, faced with this lucky dip of a prosecution as a supposed pathway to proof? We say the indictment is still unclear, six years after it was first unveiled. What kind of a prosecution we say is this? Take your choice because we're not sure, and this is the party to these proceedings which bears the burden of proving guilt beyond a reasonable doubt. And they themselves clearly, by the history of their behavior, are not sure. We say, had Mr. Crane all those years ago concentrated more time on doing his job as a lawyer and less as a politician, had he concentrated on his job as a lawyer rather than seeking to humiliate and humble an African, then maybe we would have a clearer idea today as to why we are here. So moving on, the decision to give evidence. Since he was taken to Freetown, Mr. Taylor has not said a word in his own defense. He has kept his own counsel. This is his first and perhaps only chance to give his account. Now he takes the opportunity to put forward his defense. Not because in law he has to, but because he wants to. He feels it's important to set the historical record straight. Nevertheless, before he sets out his case, he appreciates that he faces some important hurdles. So let us address them directly right at the outset. The first we acknowledge. Yes, the first is the deeply ingrained popular prejudice against Mr. Taylor held by so many who have not listened or observed the full and dreadful story of what happened in West Africa from 1989 to 2003 and what had led to it. A decade and a half period of bitter tears, still bleeding wounds, destruction and death, images of trauma, human suffering and inhumanity more easily erased from the memory than remembered because of their sheer brutality. All of this happening in the neighboring countries of Sierra Leone 
Côte d'Ivoire and Liberia, a part of the world blessed in so many ways and endowed with such great beauty. Yes, I'm talking about that prejudice based, we say, on lies, based on unsubstantiated rumor and hearsay without independent support. That public opinion, which has already given its outspoken verdict and condemned Charles Taylor. Yes, I'm talking about that prejudice which nullifies objectivity, neutralizes independence of thought, and thereby corrupts justice. Surely we are all here for more than that. Surely we are here for more than humiliation at the stroke of a pen, which says more about the humanity of the speaker than the justice of the cause. Because none of us should be here to speculate. No, we're not here to do that. Neither are we here to make intelligent guesses. No, we're not here to pursue theories. For example, that Taylor was a despot, Africa's Napoleon, bent on taking over the sub-region. We're certainly not here to act on suspicions, hunches, or six senses, or indeed on hearsay alone. We do live our lives on instincts, but we're not here to exercise instincts, to motor on on automatic. Because here in a criminal court, things slow down. Because here what is required is proof, the application of logic and intellectual honesty. So that when each of us arrive at our individual verdicts, we can say hand on heart that those verdicts were not influenced by prejudice, a previously held view unchanged by the evidence. Because a definition of a fair trial has been handed down to us after centuries of struggle. And it is a definition to which we should hold fast in a court of law. Guilt must be punished without prejudice. And where there is no guilt, then once again, prejudice must not be allowed to rear its head. This being so, before we come to deal with the charges themselves, we have certain requests to make of everyone listening. We're addressing our audience now. Firstly, that everyone approaches the case without preconceived opinions, since nothing else would be fair. For if we, coming to observe a tribunal of this kind, insist on basing our judgment upon conclusions that we have previously formed ready-made, instead of deciding in accordance with the facts, then none of us would have the right to say that we have fairly stood in judgment. Frankly, your reputation as judges would be gone. However, let us suppose that you have formed a preconceived opinion all the same. Then in that case, what we demand is this. If you find that our reasoning uproots that opinion, if our argument undermines it, if truth destroys it, please, we say, do not resist, but rather dismiss those preconceived ideas from your mind and seek to arrive at a verdict in light of the facts you find proved, drawing proper and reasoned conclusions from the evidence. Because to do otherwise, frankly, merely strengthens the very mischief we're all seeking to prevent. We also need to beware of emotion, because emotion is no useful guide to us in our task. We must be dispassionate, carefully analytical, and objective in our assessment of that evidence. No one who has seen the sad procession through this courtroom of hurt human beings reliving the most grotesque trauma would have been unmoved. We are human too, 
even whilst we declare this accused man to be not guilty of the charges he faces, we are humans too. 52 out of 91 prosecution witnesses called were crime-based witnesses. All these witnesses later, images of unspeakable humoring suffering later, must have an effect. And we appreciate that it may well skew rational and logical thought and thereby erode any notion of justice. We must therefore consciously guard against this in deciding whether any material fact has been proved beyond a reasonable doubt. Moving on. In opening the prosecution case, we were told that this case involved one overarching crime, the crime of terrorism. Thus they planned to terrorize the civilian populations of West Africa. But as I've already indicated, they also intended to take political and physical control of Sierra Leone in order to exploit its abundant natural resources and to establish a friendly or subordinate government there to facilitate that exploitation. Yet it's the indictment which should provide the roadmap to guilt. As with all maps, we expect them to be drafted with precision and that they can be trusted. Otherwise, we could get lost. Now, the first indictment against Charles Taylor was signed by David Crane on the 3rd of March, 2003, and filed with this court on the 7th of March of that year. An amended indictment was signed on the 16th of March, 2006, by Sir Desmond De Silva, as he now is, and filed with the court on the 17th of March. That was the second indictment against Charles Taylor, and it had annexed to it something called a case summary. Case summary accompanying the amended indictment. A document which purported to elaborate further on the bare bones, as it were, of the amended indictment. Less than one week before the 4th of June when the trial against Mr. Taylor was expected to start, the current chief prosecutor, Mr. Stephen Rapp, signed what would be the third indictment to be issued in this case against Mr. Taylor, with the filing on the 29th of May 2007 of the prosecution's second amended indictment. Again, and much like with the amended indictment that Prosecutor De Silva had filed, a document called a case summary accompanying the second amended indictment was filed by the prosecution on the 3rd of August 2007, purporting to elaborate on the charges that were contained in the 29th of May uh, second amended indictment. Let us now examine, for the purposes of our case, the detail of that indictment. One or two salient facts immediately become clear. The first is this, the vast bulk of the charges relate to three provinces in eastern Sierra Leone, Kono, Kailahu, and Kenema. Other provinces are implicated, but in terms of the timeline, only briefly. Now, turning to that timeline, Bearing in mind, of course, the terms of the statute which set up this court, and starting from the outer limits and working in, the plan to which Mr. Taylor is said to be party was supposedly hatched in Libya in the 1980s. It was put into effect when he invaded Liberia on Christmas Eve 1989. So at one end, that's the outer limit. We know at the other end, 
August 2003, he steps down and goes into exile. Let's just bring the boundaries in a little further now. We know that thereafter, the indictment period dates from the Abidjan Peace Accord, 30th of November 1996, through to President Kaba declaring peace in January 2002. But even within those parameters, the real core of this indictment effectively dates from February 1998 to the end of January 1999, a period when, as the prosecution rightly stated in their opening, the violence in Sierra Leone reached a crescendo. So in effect, what we're here dealing with is roughly a 12-month period from February 1998 through to the end of January 1999. Why those parameters? February 1998 is the ECOMOG intervention. When we say a group of Sierra Leonean soldiers who had formed the Junta regime, the AFRC regime, felt disgruntled, downright annoyed and angry that a force of Nigerians, without any sanction from the United Nations or anybody else, kicked them out of power in Freetown. And thereafter, history shows that those same disgruntled soldiers went on a campaign, an orgy of violence, which took them to the north of Sierra Leone, returning back to the Western District late in the year of 1998, and thereafter, on the 6th of January 1999, wreaked havoc and destruction in Freetown. That is what is at the core of this case. And that is what we shouldn't lose sight of. Yes, there are counts which extend beyond that time frame, but that period is really at the heart of this prosecution, and that's what we ought to concentrate on. Now, having examined that, let us remind ourselves also that although the indictment itself is set in narrow limits in terms of time and territory. Here in November 1996 to January 2002, solely limited to Sierra Leone, the evidence nonetheless placed before this court and relied on traverses a much wider historical and geographical period. Thus, in terms of this timeline, we were told that the plan at the heart of this design, quote, was formulated in Libya by the accused. That's a long time outside the indictment period. Further, in geographical term, much evidence is being called of events in Liberia from the likes of Hassan Bility and Tier 5590, none of which on the face of it seem to have much to do with the issue at hand, rather than a search for prejudicial evidence. So the narrow limits set by the statute have been exceeded considerably. This expansion, whilst not accepted, has to be addressed. Consequently, the defense case cannot be dealt with within a narrow compass. So let me then turn now to the defense case. Now the accused does, does take issue with the prosecution allegation that he by reason of any of the modes of liability alleged in the indictment was responsible 
for any of the crimes charged. He says simply, I am not guilty of these crimes. In a sentence, he says, how could I have been micromanaging a conflict in neighboring Sierra Leone, as alleged, when I, as newly elected president of the Republic of Liberia, had so much on my plate to deal with. Bearing in mind the core of the indictment is conveniently situated during the period of his presidency. And he's saying, how could I have been micromanaging all of these radio operators, these bodyguards, these low-level individuals who claim to have been in direct contact with Mr. Taylor when I'm running a country besieged on several sides, firstly by Ulimo, then Lerd, then Mobel, Model. How could I? Now, in giving evidence in his defense, it must be borne in mind at all times that he bears no obligation to prove his innocence. His protection is that it's for the prosecution to prove his guilt. That is because criminal trials have come, at least in those societies committed to the rule of law, to be governed by a certain logic. It is a logic the long time in the making very painful in the making, in terms of suffering, in the achievement of it. However, with that principle firmly in mind, it is anticipated that Mr. Taylor's testimony will cover the following areas. Firstly, he's going to deal with his personal background, including among other things, his background, history, and education. And why is that necessary? It's because it feeds in his origins, that is, into the ethnic politics of Liberia and the historical tension between the Congo town set, the American Liberians, that is, and the rest of the indigenous population a conflict which has been at the heart of Liberian politics for well over a century. So that's why we're looking at the background. Because frankly, that background is a history of racism constructed elsewhere but transferred to Africa. And here we will, of necessity, have to pause to consider the relationship between the United States of America and its prodigal child in Africa. Having dealt with that, we will go on to consider his involvement in EULA, the, U the Union of Liberian Associations in America, an association which began whilst he was studying in the United States of America. Having dealt with that, we will deal with his involvement with the government of Samuel Doe, and also his increasing disenchantment with the Doe regime. Having done that, we will look at the Kwiwomka attempted coup and its aftermath so brutally predictable as Doe of the minority Kran ethnic group mobilized his largely Kran army under the command of a fellow Kran, the notoriously inhuman General Charles Julie, who after murdering and mutilating Kwiwomka, who was captured after the abortive coup, the ex-general's decapitated body was displayed in a public square in Monrovia. After that, Julu was unleashed to pacify Nimba County, ancestral home of Kwiwomka. 
Julu's army carried out brutalities unprecedented in even those violent Liberia, killing thousands of defenseless peasants, destroying homes, pillaging businesses and farms, and raping women. Thousands fled in terror and horror to neighboring Cote d'Ivoire, and memories of those atrocities were still fresh in the minds of Nimba residents, when on Christmas Eve of 1989, some 100 special forces of the MPFL, armed with a couple of hunting rifles purchased in the Côte d'Ivoire, entered the town of Butu in Nimba County. They were mostly drawn from the Geo and Manu ethnic groups of Nimba County that were persecuted on the Doe's regime. They made rapid progress. The choice of Nimba County as a launch pad was deliberate and strategic as the NPFL ranks swelled, swelled overnight with willing and adventurous recruits, many undoubtedly seeking revenge for the depredations of the Do regime. Further, scores of dissidents who had gathered and congregated outside of Liberia also flocked to the banner of the NPFL, united in one cause, the elimination of, it, of Do and its ethnic crown and Mandingo supporters and the seizure of power, bluntly. It was about taking power. Now, Mr. Taylor will also deal with his arrest by the United States authorities at the request of the Doe government. That, too, has to be a part of the overall picture. Otherwise, we may fail to understand the real issues and the real forces at work behind the scene. However, when saying that, much of what we say about the background to these events is a matter of historical record. And in the circumstances, we see no need to burden this tribunal at this stage with further details. However, Mr. Taylor will go on to detail the history of the formation of the NPFL, carrying on a tradition in the name of the glorious attempt by Kriwomka. Mr. Taylor didn't invent the name NPFL. That was Kriwomka. So he was merely taking up a banner which had been so brutally crushed by Doe. Now you will deal with the motivation behind the organization of the MPFL and its philosophy. He will accept that his forces were trained in Libya. He will accept that. And that they were indeed special forces. And he will remind us that this training took place during a period of Pan-Africanist movement and struggle. And he will also explain the need to see that development against the background of a Cold War nearing its end in the face of the collapse of the Soviet Union and the construction of a world with just one superpower, the United States, and its important ally, the United Kingdom, which had a stake, remind us ourselves, in Sierra Leone, and which also the same United Kingdom feared the emergence of Nigeria as a regional superpower. And Mr. Taylor will remind us that there were groups at that camp in Libya from all over Africa and the rest of the world. He will tell us about that. And he will tell us in terms of that period, 
that he was in contact with a group of Sierra Leoneans. This is in Libya, amongst others. But the Sierra Leoneans, that group he was in contact with in Libya, they were called the Sierra Leonean African Revolutionary Movement. Pan-African Pan Revolutionary Movement. Let me say that again. The Sierra Leonean Pan-African Revolutionary Movement. They were not called the RUF. And he will also tell us that one Ali Kaba, a former student dissident from Freetown, and also a relative of Tejan Kaba, the former president of Sierra Leone, that it was that Ali Kaba who was in charge of the Sierra Leoneans in Libya. However, he will refute the suggestion that he combined with either Adi Ali Kaba or others in Libya to pursue a design to terrorize the civilian population of Sierra Leone. He will totally refute and reject that. He will assert that such a suggestion is completely contrary to the revolutionary and liberating ideology which informed the actions of those who trained in Libya, and the spirit of comradeship which infused their actions thereafter. He will point to the hypocrisy of the prosecution on this point. Whereas they accept, and again I quote Mr. Rapp from his opening, by the early 1990s, Sierra Leonean citizens had grievances against the government in place. That is accepted. Yet nonetheless, the same prosecution seek to illegitimate and demean their attempt to do something about their condition by labeling them terrorists. Thus the prosecution say, Quote, some say the RUF was fighting in Sierra Leone for a kind of national liberation, for the betterment of the people of that country. But we submit that, that, was, that there was really only a thin veneer of ideology that masked the real motive, motive of destruction and exploitation. In other words, they were from the outset merely a bunch of bandits, thieves, murderers, and rapists. That's all they were. That's the suggestion. Now, the accused will also further deal with his relationship with President Momo of Sierra Leone and his presence in that country in the late 1980s. Thereafter, he will recount the launch of the Liberian Revolution from the neighboring territory of the Côte d'Ivoire. He will detail how, despite the fact that at the outset of the revolution, he could call upon less than 200 trained special forces, he could quickly call, up, call upon tens of thousands of ordinary Liberians. Ordinary Liberians motivated by their detestation of the cruelty and carnage of the Do regime and how with that force they quickly routed Do's army. He will go on to describe how the phenomenon, that dreadful phenomenon of child soldiers had existed in this part of Africa and indeed elsewhere and had been a feature in many instances of civil war and armed insurrections around the world well before Charles Taylor emerged on the scene as the prosecution's own expert Stephen Ellis was forced to concede. 
child soldiers were not a Charles Taylor invention. Let me repeat. Child soldiers were not a Charles Taylor invention. The RUF did not need to look to him and this NPFL for a role model, although it is accepted that the brutality of the Doe's regime soldiers and supporters, particularly in Nimba County, had given it a terrible impetus with many children left as orphans with no refuge except within the ranks of the NPFL. But those children, he will tell you, were used in various roles other than combat. Now in recounting this history, he will further describe the attempt fraught with practical difficulties, made to impose discipline within the ranks of the NPFL. Having dealt with that, he will explain his relations with the RUF, his knowledge or lack thereof of its creation. He will further <laughs> describe the unplanned nature of the spillage of conflict from Liberia to Sierra Leone, a consequence in large measure of the historically known links between the two societies and the porous border between the two countries, a fact accepted by the prosecution when in opening they said Sierra Leone is located in a region where borders exist only on paper. These lines were drawn in the colonial period and do not follow ethnic or linguistic groupings. Many in upcountry border areas have closer relations to people across the border than to those in their own capital cities, which can be said with force, particularly about Kyla Hoon and that part of Eastern Sierra Leone. And he will question in looking at that history whether such a peaceful people as the Sierra Leoneans undoubtedly are, whether they are in denial of their own clearly recognized hand in the carnage visited upon themselves and thus are forced to look to another to bear the guilt. Now the accused will deny the allegation that he controlled the RUF. He will further deny any formal association with Fode Sanko, or the suggestion that he was party to a joint criminal enterprise with Fode Sanko which dated from the 1980s in Libya. In particular, the accused will refute the suggestion that as leader of the NPFL and later as president of Liberia, he was involved in any formal supply of arms and ammunition or other war material to the to the RUF or the AFRC. He will assert that this was never the official policy of the NPFL or the Liberian government whilst he was president. president. He will also explain the situation surrounding arms and ammunition supply in Liberia at that time, and the impossibility for him to provide such material as suggested by the prosecution. The accused will also describe 
the intervention of ECOWAS in the Liberian conflict through the deployment of ECOMARC. He will explain that the contributing countries to that ECOMARC force were pursuing a policy aimed at denying the NPFL the fruits of their success in mobilizing the Liberian populace against tyranny. He will outline the hypocrisy of some of those contributing countries who, whilst proclaiming that they were in Liberia to promote peace, nonetheless funded and assisted first the LUDF and LULIMO to launch an illegal war against the NPFL and by extension the Liberian people and thereby extend by several years the suffering of that same Liberian people. Life on the NPFL ruling Greater Liberia will be described. The repeated attempts to promote peace and disarmament in Liberia will be outlined and the efforts of the accused to bring about that happy outcome. The process of disarmament in Liberia will be explained and the successful transition to democratic elections in a war-ravaged country. This aspect of his evidence is directly relevant to the erroneous suggestion that he was in a position to provide arms to the RUF. <coughs> the general elections of July 1997 will be described, along with the resounding victory achieved by the accused in elections internationally observed to be free and fair, yet derided by this prosecution. The accused will go on to describe the challenges of governing a post-Civil War society. Historically divided, as he will explain, between Congo town and indigenous. Historically driven by factionalism and how he was having to contend with that whilst denied access to foreign inward investment to rebuild a a ravaged infrastructure. He will explain how he repeatedly sought to secure the Liberian Sierra Leonean border to confirm his continued assertion that the Liberian government were not assisting the RUF and further to contain the contagion of war and thereby permit his efforts to rebuild the Liberian economy. We have ample United Nations documentation to support that. It will also testify on the safekeeping and destruction of all arms, ammunition and artillery handed in during disarmament in 1997 before the general election. Destroyed by the United Nations with the approval of his government. We say that in the case of Charles Taylor, here we have a leader kept fully occupied by Liberia's national affairs, seeking to repair the past and at the same time anticipating the possible demands of the future, the arrangements by which peace had to be established, the powers needed to defend the republic. These are the matters to which he devoted himself and over which he exercised a degree of control. Matters of the utmost importance for his country engrossed his continual attention so that he scarcely had time to breathe. In these circumstances, it is surely not very surprising if, from time to time, 
there was something or another which escaped his notice. He will point out the obvious historical fact that the AFRC coup in Sierra Leone predated his coming to power as president of Liberia. He was engaged in a general election at the time with the concomitant conclusion that he played no part in the ousting of the Kaba government. There has been no evidence called to suggest that he played any part whatsoever in the AFRC coup in May of 1997. None whatsoever, not a shred of it. Furthermore, it must be borne in mind that those who seized power so illegally in Sierra Leone had no historical link whatsoever with Charles Taylor. He will testify and deny any suggestion that he provided the AFRC with any arms and ammunition although he will accept that overtures were made to him when he became president by the junta regime. He will accept that. But he will say that he rebuffed those overtures in accordance with ECOWAS policy to which he was a party. He will go on to outline Liberia's appointment to the Committee of Five after he became president and his own personal commitment to the overriding objective of that body, namely to bring peace to, to the sub-region as mandated by ECOWAS. He will point out that it was in late 1997 that Liberia was made a member of the Committee of Five on Sierra Leone and placed on the front line by his colleagues in ECOWAS to get personally involved in helping to bring peace to Sierra Leone. And again, we will provide ample written evidence from other members of the Committee of Five showing that he was personally requested to play that role. And his selection for the role should be obvious. Why not let a former rebel deal with rebels? And after all, they do share a common border. So he will testify about his involvement in dealing with the many ceasefire agreements between February 1998 to 2000. He will deal with the breakdown of those agreements and his efforts to put things back together again in order to ensure the continuation of peace. He will deal with his part in the Lome Agreement the progress towards that agreement, efforts to destabilize that agreement, and consequently, his involvement in the West Side, Okra Hill situation, his involvement with the removal of Johnny Paul Coroma from Sierra Leone to Liberia to preserve peace, the moving of Sanko and Johnny Paul Coroma from Liberia to Sierra Leone, a fact fully documented in United Nations records which show that it was at the behest of others that he became involved in that process. He will also deal with the extraction of Sam Bokhari in December 1999 from Sierra Leone to Liberia. Again, a fact fully documented in 
in United Nations records. That was done not because, as suggested, of some long-standing relationship between Taylor and Bokhari, but rather in an effort to preserve peace, which Bokhari was threatening. And we have the records to prove it. He will also deal with the appointment of Issa Sisse as the leader of the RUF. Again, not because he was the man in control of the RUF, but because a collective decision was taken at ECOWAS level that because of the situation of Sanko, they needed someone to deal with within the RUF. And he was the one deputed to bring that about. And yet now, everything is turned on its head. And that is now used against him as evidence of his control when he was merely acting in accordance with United Nations policy, which those people on the other side of this room know about. And had they had the diligence to find the documentation and place it before this court, we would not have been proceeding on a misconception these past few months. So he will deal with that. And he will deal with the subsequent final piece in Sierra Leone, all of which were done with the knowledge, consent, of, and participation of ECOWAS and the United Nations. There is ample documentary proof of it. And he will say that these activities in which he engaged was in fact carried out on behalf of ECOWAS. And that no stage was he acting in an individual capacity as president of Liberia. Good will on his part, he will say, has been turned on its head in a desperate, vain attempt to find proof. He will also vehemently deny the suggestion that he played any part in the orgy of violence which followed the Ekamog intervention in Freetown in February 1998 and which led to the removal of the AFRC regime. In like terms, he will deny any involvement in the carnage and brutality popularly described as the Freetown invasion of the 6th of January 1999. He will point to the clear historical record which makes clear who were the real perpetrators of that particular atrocity. Yet, as I indicated earlier, the vast bulk of the indictment is concerned with that core period in the history of Sierra Leone. The period when, to quote, the campaign of terror against civilians, not combatants, reached its peak. That is the period which needs to be examined with care. It falls squarely within the indictment period. In this regard, Yes, in this regard, we will ask this court to note the shadowy role of certain foreign powers whose pursuit of their own selfish interests in the region led to the continuation of the war in both Liberia and Sierra Leone. He will point in particular to the role played by such mercenary groups as executive outcomes and sandline, and the hypocrisy of the international community in denying Charles Taylor the wherewithal to protect his people against the depredations of foreign financed and supported militias, while failing to condemn the actions of others, like the United Kingdom government who acted in clear breach of United Nations injunctions. By way of example, he will show how the first attacks of Lerd followed shortly after the destruction by the Liberian government 
of arms and ammunition handed in during the ceasefire in Liberia. We say it was not just a coincidence. It will also explain that despite these domestic pressures, his, com his colleagues on the Committee of Five still sought his involvement in the Sierra Leonean crisis and implored him to bring the parties together to achieve a lasting peace. Remember the words of the statute, we say. Threaten the establishment of and implementation of the peace process in Sierra Leone. So yes, he will be explaining how these same colleagues, aided and abetted by the United Nations Secretary General, and others prevailed upon him from 1997 to 2001 to play a frontline role in the conflict as a broker for peace. He will describe in detail his efforts to defend a fledgling democracy in Liberia from the predations of foreign supported factions. Let us ask ourselves, who supported Lerd and funded them? Who supported, funded, and organized Model? Groups bent on overthrowing his government and promoting war and dissension in Liberia. It's called regime change. That's what it's called. We don't like you, so we will get rid of you. It is called regime change. And he will go on to explain how he sought to promote peace in the region, particularly to bring an end to the conflict in Sierra Leone and Ivory Coast, whilst at the same time struggling to defend his country from that foreign-inspired assault. Whilst facing continued efforts to destabilize Liberia, he will explain the prominent, continuing, crucial, and well-documented role he played in bringing about a successful agreement to the peace talks in Lome. Now, he may if it's deemed necessary. Explain the efforts made by the Liberian government to obtain the materials necessary to defend his country. He may do that if it's thought to be necessary. But in doing so, he will assert the unchallengeable right of a people to defend itself. It's called self-defense and it's no offense. And he will also explain his relationship with Sam Bokhari and his efforts to achieve the removal of Bokhari to Liberia at the behest of ECOWAS and the United Nations in order to preserve the promise of Lomé. In the same vein, he will describe the positive role he played in securing the release of the United Nations peacekeepers. And the fact that throughout that episode, he acted with the full backing, oversight, and support of the United Nations. He will finally describe the end game, the final destruction of this democracy in Liberia by foreign supported factions. He will describe his efforts to bring an end to the suffering of the Liberian people. He will describe the clear, and you may feel, shocking attempt by David Crane, chief prosecutor of the special court, to scupper the peace talks in Accra in March 2003 by timing the unveiling of the indictment against him to coincide with those efforts. Remember the words of the statute. We say that was the case 
of a supposed minister of justice seeking to scupper attempts at peace. Precisely what this court is supposed to be about, and thus the saving of life. He will describe how he magnanimously agreed to take the unprecedented step of standing down as democratically elected president of Liberia in order to spare his people continuing, continued suffering from yet more civil war against his democratically elected, let us not forget, government. And he will describe how the agreement which led to that momentous decision, him standing down, was backed by the United States, the United Kingdom, the United Nations, and several African leaders. And how that agreement was betrayed, and he was handed over, contrary to the agreement, to this court for trial. How many in Africa step down peacefully and hand over power? Power, yes, that addictive thing, so peacefully. How many do, do that? And let us remind ourselves that it's not just black Africans who have refused to hand over power in the face of the greatest obstacles. The most embedded examples are of white men refusing to hand over. Ian Smith in Rhodesia, and that vile apartheid regime in South Africa. Those are the best examples. And we will seek to expose the corruption at the heart of this prosecution. How evidence has been bought and been secured through favors. Many may have become bored with our efforts to expose this aspect of the prosecution case. But we have persisted because justice cannot be polluted in this way in our eyes. It is much too precious for that. Mr. Taylor will bluntly declare that his trial is political. And he will point, among other things, to the failure to indict former President Tejan Kaba, despite his role as defense minister in the Sierra Leonean government throughout the formation and deployment of the CDF. Or he, even though he must, the same President Kaba, on any objective analysis of the phrase, persons bearing the greatest responsibility, he must have been a more appropriate candidate for indictment than Hinga Norman. The deputy, remember, Defense Minister. So we ask, why was Kaba spared and not Taylor? Why? And we also point to, in that regard, the statements of David Crane at various times during his tenure of the role of Chief Prosecutor and others who have followed him in that role. Those are all important matters. But we ask you to underline this concern. Why so many years after this indictment was unveiled are we still faced with this lucky dip? Why? Pick your choice kind of a prosecution. Now, in concluding, we know that what we have to say during our case may take some time. We acknowledge that things may not always run smoothly during the currency of our case, because frankly, we are still preparing it. But nonetheless, experience should teach us the truth is often to be found only through a slow and painful process. That same experience should teach. It should teach us that it's better that we take time to achieve a fair verdict 
than rush to judgment because then we may have to deal with the human pain of a miscarriage of justice. And undoing that kind of pain takes time. So rather, let us give ourselves the time to do justice first time round. Those are my submissions, Your Honor. Well, thank you, Mr. Kufus. Uh, are there any other matters before we adjourn? All right. Well, the, uh, <coughs> the defense is... Uh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. No. No. I was asking uh, Mr. Kufus if there are any other matters before we adjourn. Well, I think Mr. Taylor was giving me some instructions on that. I wonder if I could have a moment. Certainly. There is a matter, uh, uh, Your Honours, which uh, Mr. Taylor would like me to raise with you at this moment. Bearing in mind that his testimony is likely to last for several weeks, and the obvious strain and pressure that that must place upon an individual who is giving testimony in a case of this gravity, the application is that during the giving of his evidence, we sit a four-day week, but not on Fridays, in order to give him an opportunity of, frankly, recharging his batteries because of the length of time he will be giving evidence. And we consider in the circumstances, whereas we are anxious to conclude this trial of, and indeed his testimony as soon as possible, your honors might consider that in these unique circumstances, it may be a reasonable application that we're making. It's only for the, his evidence, not for the rest of the defense case. Uh, that's appreciated. Uh, well, uh, that's a matter that uh, we'll decide and uh, deliver our decision tomorrow morning. But be before we adjourn, uh, did you have any views on that, uh, Mr. Rapp? Well, Your Honors, uh, we have this courtroom uh, exclusively through December as far as the ICC is concerned and uh, I don't want us to lose any of the time that we have uh, available here and uh, other witnesses uh, some have been on the stand uh, for more than a week uh, some for more than two and and they testified on Friday and it's only a part day and it's only a five and a half hour day uh, so we've respectfully uh, uh, asked that we use the time that's available to us uh, to proceed with this case thank you well, Mr. Griffiths, uh, was anything said there that you wanted to reply to? Not at all, Your Honor. All right, thank you. Well, <coughs> the defence is uh, due to call evidence to morning, uh, tomorrow morning. Uh, this court is adjourned until 9.30 tomorrow. All rise. <coughs>